Hi friends, my name is Tris and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. Today I'm going to take you from zero to rust in 10 minutes. The content of this presentation is based on the excellent blog post A Half Hour to Learn Rust by the preeminent Amos Fenger. Amos's incredible deep dive tutorials were a big part of my Rust journey, and you should read everything he's ever written. I find Amos's fast articles to be exactly compatible with how my brain works, and so, after telling dozens of people to go read this article, I decided to just make a video on it. I reached out to Amos on Twitter, and he generously said go for it. Any errors in this video are because I have deviated from his original post. As Amos says, instead of focusing on one or two concepts, we are going to go through as many Rust snippets as possible and explain what the keywords and symbols they contain mean. This is going to be fast, I need you to read and listen at the same time. Ride the pause button if you need to, I believe in you. After you have installed Rust from RustUp.rs, you are ready to begin. Let introduces a variable binding. This can be written as a single line. I32 is a signed 32-bit integer. You can specify the variable's type explicitly after a colon, which is called a type annotation. Behind the scenes, languages such as Python hide the implementation from you, and quietly promote the length of the integer at runtime when needed. This is clever, but inefficient when you know how big your numbers are going to be. Rust, of course, has crates that provide this dynamic behavior if you need it. But how do you choose which integer type to use in Rust? In general, if you just need to represent some number, use an i32. 32 bits has a wide enough range that it's relatively unlikely to overflow, and signed numbers have fewer surprises than unsigned numbers. i32 is equivalent to a long in C or an int in Java. If you use a numeric literal and don't explicitly annotate the type, Rust will default to i32. If you declare a name and initialize it later, the compiler will prevent you from using it before it's initialized. I know this sounds obvious, but C crashes at runtime if you try to do this. The underscore is a special name, or rather, a lack of name. It basically means to throw away something and not warn about it not being used. This pattern of strict defaults with escape hatches to not be overly annoying is one you will see a lot with Rust. Rust has tuples, which you can think of as fixed length collections of values of different types. Note that the Rust compiler can nearly always infer the types that you are using, and only rarely do you need to clarify ambiguous cases. How many times have you thought you were working with one type of variable, only to realize through an error it was actually another? Rust helps you out here. Tuples can be destructured when doing an assignment, which means they're broken down into their individual fields. This is especially useful when a function returns a tuple, such as in the second example with split at middle. When destructuring a tuple, an underscore can be used to throw away part of it. The semicolon marks the end of a statement. Unlike in other languages, semicolons are not just mandatory whitespace. This is an example of Rust's powerful, elegant iterators. We'll talk about them later. In Rust, like in Lisp, nearly everything is an expression. fn declares a function. At the top, we have a void function, a function that returns nothing and below, a function that returns an integer. The arrow indicates a function's return type. A pair of brackets declares a block, which has its own scope, sort of like an immediate function in JavaScript. This interior variable x only lives as long as the block does, and does not modify the external x. Blocks are also expressions, which means they evaluate to a value. If you've written Lisp or Ruby, this should start to feel very familiar. Inside a block, there can be multiple statements. We call the final expression of a block the tail. This is what the whole block will evaluate to. These are equivalent. This is why omitting the semicolon at the end of a function is the same as returning. If conditionals are also expressions. Note that this whole function returns an integer. A match is also an expression, not a statement. Dots are typically used to access fields of a value, or call a method on a value. Just like in most C-style languages, dots are used for attributes or methods. The double colon is similar but operates on namespaces. This distinction provides great clarity between if you're using a property or a namespace. In the first example, std is a crate, which is a library, cmp is a module, which is a source file, and min is a function. The use directive can bring names from other namespaces into scope. Rust has strict scoping rules. If you don't see it in your source code, it's not available. Types are namespaces too, and methods can be called as regular functions. STR is a primitive type, but many non-primitive types are also in scope by default. Let's get into the type system. Structs are the backbone of Rust's excellent rich type system. Think of structs as lightweight new types encapsulating the valid states of your system. Match arms are patterns. A match has to be exhaustive, at least one arm needs to match, and an underscore can be used as a catch-all pattern. 
In addition to these primitive integer matches, you can also match deeply nested data and destructure it for ease of use. You can declare methods on your own types, like here where we're adding an isPositive method to our new number struct, and then we can use our new methods like usual. Variable bindings are immutable by default, which means their interior can't be mutated, and also they cannot be assigned to. Those of you coming from functional languages like Haskell will be very pleased to see immutability by default, rather than other C-like languages which typically have immutability added on later through keywords like const. Though Rust isn't strictly a functional language, it is clear that the language design has balanced practicality with purity from the functional world. Functions can be generic. They can have multiple type parameters, which can then be used in the function's declaration and its body instead of concrete types. Think of them like a template string. Note that in this case, both A and B must be of the same type, T. The standard library type, vec, which is a heap allocated array, is generic. v1 is a vector of integers, v2 is a vector of booleans. Behind the scenes, vectors use an array and swap it out for a larger array at runtime when it reaches full capacity. Speaking of vec, it comes with a macro that gives us more or less vec literals. v1 is a vector of integers, i32 as usual, and v2 is a vector of booleans. All of these invoke a macro. Macros just expand to regular code. You can recognize them by the bang at the end of the name. In fact, printline is a macro. This expands to something that has the same effect as the second block here. Panic is also a macro. It violently stops execution with an error message and the file name and line number of the error. Some methods also panic. For example, the option type can contain something or it can contain nothing. If unwrap is called on it and it contains nothing, it panics. Option is not a struct, it's an enum with two variants. Note the generic type parameter. An option sum can be of any type. Enum's variants can be used in patterns. Result is also an enum. It can either contain something or an error. It also panics when unwrapped and containing an error. Functions that can fail typically return a result, like here, where we're creating a UTF-8 string from bytes. Not all bytes represent a valid string. Talk to anyone who is still using Python 2. In the first example, we can see that S1 is the OK variant of the results enum, but S2 is the error variant of the results enum. This pattern of errors as values keeps us in the functional world where other languages would have exceptions which break us out. If you want to panic in case of failure, you can unwrap. Here we're deliberately quitting our program on a bad UTF-8 string, or you can use expect for a customer error message. It's called expect because it telegraphs to people reading both the code and the errors what you were expecting when you unwrapped the result. As with all things, we don't always get what we want. You can also match and handle the error, or in this case, panic anyway. Or you can use iflet to safely destructure the inner value if it is okay. Or you can bubble up the error, returning it to the calling function, which then handles it. This pattern of unwrapping the value inside a result if it's okay or returning it if it's an error is so common that Rust has dedicated syntax to do it. The question mark operator at the end of line two does the exact same thing as the larger match statement on the previous slide. This is the normal Rust error pattern in application code where you're trying to just write the happy path, though the previous options are available to you when you need them. Finally, let's talk about iterators. This is my favorite iterator. It's an iterator that represents all natural numbers from one to infinity. This is possible to store in RAM because iterators are computed lazily on demand. This iterator notation is called a range. The most basic iterators are ranges. They can be open at the bottom or top, or you can specify both exactly. Computation only happens when the iterator is called. Anything that is iterable can be used in a for loop. We've just seen a range being used, but it also works with a vec or a slice, or an actual iterator. Note that string literals also have a dot bytes iterator if you want the raw bytes. Rust's char type is a Unicode scalar value that is always a valid character. You can use an iterator in a for loop even if the iterator items are filtered and mapped and flattened. This fluent interface pattern you will find everywhere in Rust. Not classes, not mutating shared data. Modeling your program state as structs and then writing functions to move between these valid states makes invalid states unrepresentable. Writing Rust is a very different experience to reading Rust. On one hand, it's more difficult. You're not reading the solution to a problem, you're actually solving it. But on the other hand, the Rust compiler helps out a lot. 
For all of the intentional errors made throughout this video, the compiler always has very good error messages and insightful suggestions. And when there's a hint missing, the compiler team is not afraid to add it. We're out of time. I cut out lifetimes, closures, and traits to keep this video fast. Read Amos's original blog post, which is linked in the description. For more Rust material, I recommend the Rust book or Rust by example. If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my Hope Punk podcast, Lost Terminal. And if you'd like to watch more of my fast technical videos, click the bottom video. Transcripts and markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.